All right, it's 7.01 Eastern time. Good evening and welcome to tonight's CAOMS educational webinar. As we all know across the country, many of us are currently living in areas that are experiencing lockdowns. So I hope everyone is coping and outside of work, everyone is staying close to home. We all hope that this wave will be over soon and we can avoid ideally a fourth wave. That sounds quite frightening. If you're like me and have kids at home, we need to be, we need the weather to cooperate and uh, allow all our extracurricular activities to resume just to get them outside and out of our hairs. I would like to remind everybody to please mute your microphones. And as always, um, at the end of the seminar, please forward any questions that you have to Tony Chahadi using the chat function and he will uh, be able to moderate the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to thank our current sponsor, Densply Serona, uh, and all of Densply's uh, management team, including Perm Pohar, Director of Sales, and Don Kladaluk, our regional rep out here in Alberta, for supporting and arranging tonight's webinar. As all of you know, Densply Serona has been a longtime supporter of the COMS. They often sponsor our national meeting Friday evening social events. And the last one we can all think about was at the top of the Calgary Tower for an excellent evening of dinner and magic. Uh, for this, I would like us all to watch the Dense by Serona video that they've provided. Densply Serona to me means um, it's it means in innovation. It's a company that's all about innovation, about providing solutions for dentists to provide excellent uh, oral health care for their patients. And um, and I'm very proud of what Densply Serona does as an organization because we spend a lot of time and a lot of investments in R and D um, to try and come up with new solutions that makes our dentists' lives and patients' lives much better. I've been with. Densply Serona for 18 amazing years, delivering products to doctors that have changed the way they do dentistry. The fact that we're making such an impact in the world, bringing innovative products to our doctors, and in turn, just making the patient experience more enjoyable. Right now, I'm inspired by just the coziness of my home office. But what I truly miss about the office is the people the great people we work with. It's a dynamic team and just creating something, something new every day and helping to create healthier smiles is so powerful. That gives me so much energy and I strive by that. It's a super innovative company which provides the best solutions for dentists and dental practices for them to help create better patient outcomes. Well, it's the tools and the products that we're putting into the hands of our dentists that really do impact the patient experience. The efficiency, the predictability, affordability. We're the leaders in the industry. I, I, I'm very proud of the fact that we have the best products and they're, the products themselves influence the patient experience. So it all comes down to the patient being the winner. I would like to think that we do influence patient outcomes for sure, um, again through the products, whether it's diagnostic products or procedural products that we have. Um, I know for sure that we do have a positive influence on, on patient outcomes and that's one of the beautiful things about working for Densply Serona. It's so dynamic, uh, no day is the same than the other. So there's every day there's something new, uh, new challenges, exciting challenges and that's what I truly love. Dentistry is moving very, very fast. And only a fraction of that is taught in the traditional way at universities. At Dance by Sona, we pride ourselves to also lead clinical education. And sometimes it's us, the industry, that can connect the dots and just provide that little bit of extra knowledge that allows our customers, the dental professionals, to be a little bit better than their peers and to do a little bit better job to provide the healthy smiles. So yes, I think that is worth a lot. I think customers should be part of One Dears because it's a phenomenal loyalty program. Uh, we've worked on this for quite a while now and we think we've got an excellent program that rewards all our, you know, all our customers 
um, for their purchases and their investment and their loyalty to us. When we created this program, it, we really took the voices of you into account to come back with a program for you. The, the outcome of this program is essentially what you ask for. You have access to preferential pricing, better savings, cashbacks. There's so much to discover. You cannot lose. You know, if they want to have an easier time performing dentistry, then they need to be involved with Dent Spice or Honor. So thank you again, Denspy, Serona, and their entire group, um, Perm, Don, and all your uh, support teams for sponsoring tonight's event. I would now like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Mark Ludlow is Division Director of Implant Prosthodontics, Associate Professor and Co-Director of the Digital Dentistry Residency at the Medical University of South Carolina. He completed his DMD dental training at the University of Connecticut, and then went on to do prosthodontic training at North Carolina. Dr. Ludlow has been involved in various research projects, along with product development in Alpha, along with beta testing, and with numerous dental companies and implant manufacturers. He has lectured nationally, internationally on a variety of topics involving surgical implant placement, restoration, guided implant surgery, digital dentistry, and fixed prosthodontics. As a practicing and teaching prosthodontist, Dr. Ludlow's passion is the development and integration of digital technology in the practice of everyday implant and restorative dentistry. Just as a reminder, Mark will take questions following the presentation. Please address any questions that you have using the chat function towards Tony Chahadi, and he'll moderate the session at the end. So please, a warm welcome for Dr. Mark Ludlow. Thank you again. All right, well, thank you guys. Let me get my screen going here. All right. Well, like I say, I'm really excited to be here with you guys. I'm really excited to go through this topic tonight. And again, I, you know, we we're chatting beforehand. I think it's a really cool thing what you all have done with, uh, you know, be able to create this forum, you know, how it kind of got you through a lot of the COVID stuff. And, and now it's kind of transitioned a little bit, but like I say, I really appreciate the invite and the ability to speak with you guys this evening. So hopefully we can go through some stuff, which will make your clinical lives a little bit easier and uh, really kind of help you in a different way if you're wanting to get into any of these digital modalities at all. So kind of, let me just close this little part down. There we go. Okay. Now just kind of moving forward, uh, you know, as we kind of saw that video, I just like to thank Dent Spice Serona as well, because, you know, they're, they're helping us out today to get this thing going. So, and I do a lot with them. The kind of cool thing about this, this lecture and pretty much every lecture that I ever have done for them is they don't say one iota as to what I should speak about or not speak about or this, that, and the other. So all of this stuff is just stuff that I find useful um, that has helped me in my practice and, you know, and helps us at the medical university as well. So what we're going to try to do, you know, in the next hour or so is we've got a variety of different types of patients which come into to our practices. You know, we've got the more simple kind of implant patient which comes in like this. And again, to be honest, this actually could be a more difficult one as well because it's right there in the aesthetic zone with a pretty high smile line. But we've got the more kind of simple, easy type situations that come in and we have this go all the way up to the more complex where we're going kind of a full mouth, full arch, double arch type of rehab. And, you know, what we're trying to do is to try to use a fully digital workflow with these, with these things, but really use them in a way in which we're giving sound surgical, sound prosthetic, sound, all the different principles that we need so we can get very predictable, good results. And that's why, you know, I'm going to go through a couple of different workflows, which you're going to see today. And that's actually why we've developed these workflows over the years is because with both of these things, you know, this is what we're kind of trying to achieve is some predictability so that we get the same good result every single time. Because the reality is sometimes we can have these cases and things can end up in a very, very different way. You know, that single central can end up in ways in which we really don't want it to end up, you know, from the placement level, from the provisional level, et cetera. Then this full arch case, which we see here on, on our right on the screen, you know, 
again, same type deal, implants placed in very difficult positions. And this literally was her temporary that she came walking in with. And it's for these reasons to help us simplify these more difficult parts in the treatment that we've actually developed a lot of these, uh, these workflows that we'll go through today. So with every single case that I go through today and every single case that we do here is we follow kind of the same type pattern with all of them. So how do we work up and do all of these cases is this is kind of what we do for them. It's a pretty simple pattern. If we start with scan, then we go to plan, and then we go to treat. And so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna go through kind of all the technologies in these different things relative to these areas. And then we're gonna put them all together to look at those, those two cases we saw at the start. And again, if we've got some time, a third case as well, okay? So what we're gonna start with here with technology is the scanning part. And if you looked at that again, there's two different scans that we take. And again, what I'm going to start with just real quickly is CBCT. I'm not going to spend really any time on this just because I think all of us kind of understand the rationale and why we all like using CBCT. It's just because, you know, when you have patients that come in like this, and this lady came into me, you can see she's wearing two sets of dentures. This is her pan. You know, my assistant had it up, you know, the pan up right there waiting for me. And I'm looking at it and she's saying, you know, I want full arch implant. She says, I hate these dentures. They're the worst. I want, you know, I've seen these commercials for these all in four things. I want this. And, you know, I'm looking at this, this pan and I'm just salivating going sweet. Let's get this, you know, the surgical suite fired up. Let's get you back there and get rolling. And it's interesting. Cause you know, we, we got our dentures. We did what's called the dual scan where we go ahead and take a CBCT of the denture, put it in the mouth and go from there. But I think why CBCT is so important is because if you look at this from 2D, she's actually looking pretty good. But then you look at her from 3D and that lovely bone that we see from 2D, you know, as we scroll through this and we're going from the, the back right all the way around to the other side. When we scroll through there, we see that while from a height and whatnot perspective, she looks pretty good from 2D, she looks absolutely and utterly abysmal from the 3D perspective. And I think it's for that reason and that reason alone is that ability to let us see things in ways in which we can't from a 2D perspective that makes CBCT so important. And that's, and again, I think everybody on this call understands that. That's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it. But that's, you know, the first scan that we generally take with our patients is the CBCT. The second scan, and again, I think this is probably the one where all of my patients, this is kind of where we begin their whole visit with me when they first come in and it's their real first touch point with technology is with a conventional intraoral scan you know i haven't take it, taken man i can't remember the last time i took a diagnostic initial impression to be truly honest because uh, you know all these ones we actually you know start off scanning and you know with scanning it, you know if we were in a forum we could actually talk together i'd kind of see where or all you guys are on you know who owns scanners who has it but the reality is these things are getting much, much more commonplace in the market and in practices. And I think it's just like anything at all. We want to be able to scan with these things and capture all the information that, that we normally would from our diagnostic impression. We wanna get the teeth, we wanna get the tissue. You know, if we're needing to get back, you know, to build dentures, you know, provisional dentures, anything like that, get all the way back to the tuberosities or up the retromolar pads. We basically need to just get these things scanned in such a way that it gives us all the diagnostic information that we're going to need to kind of move forward all the steps from there. You know, I've, I've been, I got my first scanner actually back in 2006. So it's been quite a while. And I think the question that I got back then and that I still get extremely frequently these days is this, you know, do these things really work? You know, you see, again, if you started way back then, you know, when I first got my scanner, a lot of what we saw wasn't really the greatest thing in the world. And I've really been looking at this from a data perspective for a very long time is really trying to see if, you know, do scanners work as well as impression material. And, you know, for years, we kind of made these really interesting studies where we'd have, you know, it was always on different types of typodonts or different types of models. And we'd have like this specific type of PMMA, you know, the simulated enamel and stuff, but it really never ended up you'd never scan in these studies kind of what we really scan with our patients. And so finally, a couple of years ago, we had this idea of actually using cadavers to where we would go ahead. This was kind of the first one we, which we did. 
and we took her maxilla. We scanned her with, with seven different scanners. We took conventional impressions multiple time on her. And then what we did is we got that maxilla and we actually put it in an industrial scanner to, and that industrial scanner could scan down to about one micron. So it, it allowed us to get something as true as humanly possible, but something that also had, you know, tissue, tissue, teeth, all the different, you know, materials that you'll find in somebody, et cetera. So it really allowed us to see things for the first time and digitize something that we really actually treat in practice. And what we saw when we went ahead and merged everything, we started looking at the accuracy of these things. What we saw was when we saw the full arch trueness of teeth. And what that means is that means the accuracy kind of going from here, from the second molar side all the way across to the other second molar side. The full arch trueness of the teeth when you go cross arch like that was between 25 and 51 microns. And what was really interesting was there was absolutely no significant difference to conventional impressions. Matter of fact, three of the scanners actually trounced conventional impressions. And that was from scanners from, from about 2000, you know, we, the way publishing works, you know, you do a study and then it takes you friggin' forever to get things through. But, you know, we did it in 2018, published it in 2019. So in that time, just alone, there was upgrades, there was better things, et cetera. So it's gotten better and better and better and better. But all I can say is these things truly do work and they actually do quite a bit for us. And I think one of the biggest things which it actually does for us is this, and again, this guy was in for, is going to do an upper hybrid on him, you know, and some other work. And the reality is what I think the biggest thing which this can help us with is the ability to scan a patient, sit the patient up and kind of show them the different things that are going on in their mouth. Because they've never really seen, you know, this is how tight your teeth teeth are hitting, you know, they've never seen the frication here. They've never seen the wear that's going on. They've never seen a lot of things before in any other way. And what this does is this allows us to really help with kind of working up a case, helping the patient understand why they need X, Y, and Z. And I think really helps from the practice management side of, of doing, especially the larger cases, because, you know, again, I don't know about you guys. I have a ton of people that come into me, you know, seen multiple different people or groups or this, that, and the other. And the technology has really helped in getting these patients on board with doing the cases, you know, with us. Cause first off, it's something that every other practice isn't doing and they can really see things and they're intrigued in ways in which they haven't been before. And it really has helped get buy-in with the, especially the bigger types of treatment that we, we end up doing. Cause it, probably most of my practice is actually on the full arch. And so it was really helped from that regard, but that's something that, you know, you really don't hear too much talked about in these type of lectures, but from a practice management side, it really can help with things. Now, again, because we have a short amount of time, I'm just going to, you know, talk on a couple of these different things, but you know, what are some of the practicalities with it? If we want to take our patients from here and digitize them, which you see here, what are some of the things to, that can kind of help us out? You know, especially if you're just getting into this, there can be a learning curve a little bit sometimes, but what are the things that can help you out? I think one of the biggest things that can help you out, especially, you know, whether it's you or your staff that's scanning is just getting the lips out of the way. And I like using these things right here. They're called Optrigates. You can get them by Eva Clark, just gets the lips out of the way. And it makes the full arch diagnostic scannings a whole heck of a lot easier. And the other thing, which I really like them for, if you've never done this before, I love it for guided surgery and pretty much any type of surgery because it gets everything out of the way, out of my field. And so I can go ahead and do the surgery really in an easier viewing field than I can any other way. So again, this is just a nice little tool, especially if you're very first getting into scanning or your assistant's just getting into scanning, get some optrogates, get the lips out of the way, and you're going to see a dramatic increase in how quickly you can scan and how accurate those scans happen to be. Okay. So that's the first thing. That's kind of the easier tip. The more difficult, well, not more difficult, but a little bit the more advanced tip is this one, is, is the scan pattern, because this doesn't really get talked about too much. You know, for both of these, whether it's that single implant and that, you know, central incisor or the full arch, which we see on our right, we're going to scan the full arch on it. And so when you start looking at a full arch, you have a couple questions. The first is, you know, where do you actually begin using your scanner? And after you begin somewhere, then what do you do with it? Because most of the time, you know, when you buy the scanner, people come in and just say, oh yeah, you just kind of put it in there. You wave it around, you make, you know, the sign of whatever and boom, you have this sweet model. But the reality is these, the models are all built off of math. You know, these algorithms that are within the machine. And so you kind of need to give the algorithms how they want them. 
And when we started out looking at this, we'd call all the manufacturers and manufacturers just said, well, you just kind of wave it around and, and do it. But, you know, do you do something like this where you kind of go back and forth, back and forth, or do you go kind of around lingually? Or what the heck do you do with these once you actually get it in the mouth? Well, the reason why I bring that up is because truthfully, it 100% depends upon the scanner. Now, if you're just scanning a little quadrant, honestly, you can do anything you want in there and you're going to be within about 10 to 15 microns of accuracy of scanning. But if you want to scan a full arch, and especially if you're doing diagnostics for a full arch, especially a big case on a full arch, you really need to get some accuracy on that because if the scan's off, your guides are going to be off, your diagnostic wax-ups are going to be off, everything downstream is going to be off. So you need it as good as you can possibly get it. And so what we did is we set out to find this. And what we found, I'll just cut kind of right to the chase here, depending upon the scanner which you have, you do very different things. For those of you that own something like a plant scan, you start at the canine and you roll it back and forth and back and forth across the teeth. If you have an Itero, a prime scan or a trios, you basically start lingual, go all the way across, come back occlusal, go facial all the way across. And that's how you do that model. If you've got something like the Omnicam or the Emerald or the Emerald S, you start lingual 90, kind of lingual 45, occlusal, facial, 45, facial 90, and then you do this little roll scan, which you see right here going all the way across. So truthfully, if you want to scan these things and scan them correctly, you got to get the data to, to the machine in a certain way. And this right here, again, depending upon which scanner you have, is really going to help you do that. Okay. So that's kind of most of the things from the scanning. One other thing which really helps with the scanning, especially, you know, with your orthognathic cases, with your full arch cases, if you're gonna be building temporaries, with anything where you're gonna be building temporaries, is this, this little tip will take you literally five seconds to do, but it pays big dividends later, is what you can do is all of these scanners are, that you'll use are in color. Just go ahead and get articulating paper, have them go tap, 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 or manipulate them into CR to get the CR bite. And then, you know, scan the opposing arch you know, from where you're working with those marks on there, because after you finish, you scan the opposing arch, you scan the arch you're going to be treating, then you scan the bite, you'll get a heat map, okay, in every software out there. And what you can do is you can look at that heat map and just make sure that the bite marks that you made are the exact same as what you were seeing from the, from the paper, from the CR bite that you did. And that way you've got a verified bite before the patient even leaves your office. Again, it takes you five extra seconds just to throw on a little bit of bite paper in there, but it pays big dividends because that way, you know, every step you go downstream from this thing really is going to pay off. Okay. Now, what if you don't have one? If you don't have one, you can still do everything I'm going to talk about today. Just go ahead and take your impression, you know, work with the lab. The lab can go ahead and scan things, you know, pour up, scan the models, get you the, the digital files, which you need. And then from there, you can go ahead and start moving forward with these things. But basically, the angle of the scanning portion is going ahead and getting the CBCT and getting really nice scans of the arches that you're going to be working on. So that's scanning. So what we do from scanning is we take all, the, all that data we get from those two scans and start putting it together from a planning perspective. And there's two different ways that we're going to actually plan things. One is the digital design, and that's in lieu of waxing up, and sometimes I feel like a heretic as a prosthodontist because I should have like a PKT in my pocket, but I haven't physically waxed a case in nearly 10 years now because I do it all on a computer. And it really pays some, it, it's funny, I, I, I teach our, our, a lot of our oral surgeons and I, I'm, I precept down in our oral surgery residency and I've even got my oral surgery residents I went down to their resident room yesterday and they were just doing this exact thing where they were planning and just digitally waxing up this full arch of a patient to get things set for the workup. And, and I love digital designs because, you know, we can easily change molds like we see here, with just the click of a button, you can kind of change things into different orientations. You can do a lot of different things from it. But the thing that I like most about it, it again, it goes back to talking with our patients and our ability to kind of show them what we want to do for them and help get some buy-in from them from a practice management side. Because what we can do with all these technologies is we can have a patient kind of come in like this, take some photographs, go ahead and take the scans. 
you know, and again, hopefully a lot of your restorative dentists will be doing a lot of these things for you. But I think you guys know as well as me that sometimes that's not always the case. And so working with a good lab, having somebody in your office do some of these different things can also work. But basically what we can do digitally is we can take the digital scan like we see here and do any of the diagnostics that we normally would do on, on him and transfer that over to, to a digital articulator and a digital field. Because when I was looking at him, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to have to open your bite. I'm going to have to open you up about four millimeters. And I can go and open that thing up from a digital articulator perspective. From that point, I can go ahead and digitize the teeth and start digitally waxing him up. And it was really interesting because I was doing this while the guy was actually sitting there. And so I got the teeth kind of waxed in real quickly like this. And he says, well, that's really kind of cool. But, you know, how's that going to look on me? And I said, well, let me just take a picture. So I went ahead and took a picture of him, imported that in. Then we're able to merge that wax up so that they can kind of see what it's going to look like. But I think the other thing, which it really does a lot for us, is we can toggle on and off the transparency of these teeth. So we can say, okay, you know, we're going to have to take these teeth out. We're going to have to crown lengthen. We're going to have to do these different types of things. And that way the patient can get a real good idea as to what needs to go on in their mouth to be able to accomplish what they're wanting to do and what they're looking for. Okay. So and again, they're, you know, this was a great thing to be able to show patients. And I, you know, we take facial scans and stuff like that as well, but I'll be honest, I actually like just the static picture like this and importing it in so that I can, I can look at it from the 2d perspective. And I actually think this works a little bit better than that. You know, facial scans look awesome for lectures, but I just haven't found their practicality to be as great um, when we actually get to, to using them for the, for the diagnostics. Okay. But again, what we can do is we can take that, we can move into provisionals, we can move into finals with these implants like we see on the upper here and, and go from there, okay? So that's planning from the kind of diagnostic wax up perspective. Let's get more into the planning now of the implant planning, okay? And with this part, I'm gonna look at kind of two different two different ways to plan these types of cases. Cause we, we talked about the simple case and the more complex case, and I'm going to go through both of those, but the bottom line with all of this, with the planning is this, is you really have to just decide how you want to work these cases up. You know, do you want to do it yourself and go ahead and kind of import all these different data points in yourself, sit down on the computer yourself and start to plan stuff. And if that's what you want to do, you can do that. Okay, that's what I prefer to do, you know, pretty much 99% of the time, just because I, I really like to plan my fixtures and know exactly where I'm, you know, I'm going to be placing them, etc. Or what you can do is you can work with a company, again, Dent Supply Serona, they've got their planning services, and I'll kind of talk a little bit about that so you can have them plan. You know, labs have their services, you can work with them, and they can plan it for you. It just really depends upon you know, what the model is in your office and how you're going to spend your most time and how you're going to have the most predictable results. And so both of these are great ways to do it. It just 100% depends upon how you want to do it in your practice to move things forward. Okay. Now it doesn't matter which way you go, whether you're planning it yourself or whether someone else is planning, I still think you no need to know these principles as if you were planning it yourself because you need to check the work kind of of everybody else going before you relative to these things. So what things do you really need to know for these cases? Well, for the single implants, for planning kind of, you know, anything here in the aesthetic zone, the onesie, the twosie, the different things like that, the thing I think of that is most used to help me plan these cases is what's called the three, two rule. And this is by Lyndon Cooper, you know, he's one of my mentors. Um, I know he's spoken, you know, up to you guys before up there, but this, I think has changed the way I look at implants and plan implants more than just about anything, anything I do. And what the three, two rule it implies is this, is it's a 100% prosthetically driven rule. And the reason why we go ahead and we take that first scan, we take the CBCT, and then we do that wax up is because what that tooth does for us is it's more than just showing the patient saying, hey, check out this cool tooth. What it does is it gives us two very distinct landmarks that really help us when we can plan these cases. And the two landmarks that we use when, when we go ahead and plan these things digitally are this. 
The first is the CEJ or, you know, the gingival margin area. And the other is the incisal edge. Okay. Between those two landmarks, we can pretty much plan any case. And what the three, two rule stands for is this is from this CEJ area, you go three millimeters up, then two millimeters lingual. And that's where you go ahead and put the implant. So when we look at it planned here, you know, kind of just about three millimeters up here, a scotch over two millimeters here, it gets us in this nice lingual bone so we can have it for the immediate, immediate placement here. And again, it lines everything up so that surgically and prosthetically, we've got enough space to place the implant, to have the running room for our abutment come out and be able to get a really nice predictable result, okay? Now, what I use the incisal edge for is the final angulation, okay? The three, two allows me to get my depth and get me bodily placed where I want, you know, mesial distal buccal lingually. And then the incisal edge allows me to be able to tip the implant at that point to make sure if I want something screw retained that we're getting that screw access, you know, behind the incisal edge position, okay? But from those two, two regions, you can go ahead and plan pretty much everything. Now, the complex ones, and we were talking about this in kind of our call, you know, with guys running this two days ago, and we got to talking a little bit about complex cases. Now, complex cases are a little bit harder to plan, and, and how I've broken that down is I, I developed this thing I like to call the three A's protocol, okay? And what that is, is basically when we're looking at full arch cases, I like to plan everything from the first A, which is from the abutment level, because the implants can be in all sorts of orientation and orientations as long as the abutments, you know, prosthetically are coming down like a picket fence, like we want it. So we plan everything from the abutment level. Then we make sure we have adequate space and that things are aligned. Okay. So those are the three A's. Now, the reason why we want to make sure we have adequate space is because to be honest, if we don't have adequate space, everything period prosthetically will break. It doesn't matter if it's zirconia, metal acrylic, you know, PFM, what have you. If there's no space, everything breaks. And it's interesting, the day that that one came in, just that week, and luckily none of these were mine, but I get sent kind of all the screw ups and breaks and different stuff like that. But I had a broken zirconia hybrid, a broken, P this particular broken P uh, metal acrylic hybrid, and I had a broken PFM hybrid all come in that same week. So lack of adequate space, pretty much everything will break. Then from the alignment side, why we wanna make sure everything's aligned is because if not, you can get screw holes coming in areas where we really don't want prosthetically. This one was really tough. You can see kind of where the screw axis had to be coming through here. And this was even with, you know, 30 degree multi-change, you know, uh, multi-unit abutments on there. And it was still coming right through the facial of these things. So that's why we don't want to get into those situations. That's why we're going to plan it in this particular way. Okay. So again, what we do, and this is the case that we'll see a little bit later on. So I'm not going to spend a lot of the time when we see the case going back through the planning, because we're looking at it here, but I like planning all the implants. You know, I've got the prosthetics there. I've got my digital wax up. I've got my scan of everything else. And we're I'm planning the implants here along with the abutments. Because again, what I'm needing to make sure is that everything's aligned from the abutment level. So we've got everything planned from the abutment level. Then we go to adequate. And I get this question all the time, what is the adequate space that we need? Well, there is no standard. It really 100% depends upon what the restorative is you're doing over the top of it. And this is one of the type of things that, you know, I think before we lay even, you know, that first flap or anything, we need to have in our mind and in, in detailed with the restorative doc, what is the final restorative material? Because we will reduce differently depending upon which restorative material we're using. You know, if you look at an overdenture, you need about eight millimeters. Fixed implant cases, conventional fixed bridge work is about 10. Zirconia hybrids are between 10 and 12. PFM hybrids, similar. Metal acrylic is, men, is a minimum of about 15. Conus 15 and trefoil is 22. And again, Conus, they've dropped that to saying, well, now you can get away with 12. 
but I still think just the stack height on everything, you know, I, I go with the older recommendation, which was 15, just because sometimes you run out of space with these things. So you just need to know that before we begin. So let's go ahead and look at our case. So this is what we see on her. What we're doing on her is we're gonna do a zirconia hybrid and you can see the bone in red, you can see the digital wax up here in gray. And with this, you know, where are we at? What do we need to do? Well, with her, we're gonna have to go ahead and level off this bone just because we don't have enough space here with where the bone is. And so the way we're gonna do that is, is by cutting. When I cut that, we're gonna have about 12 to 14 millimeters of restorative space, which is gonna be plenty. The way I'm gonna do that is with a bone reduction guide like you see here. And then again, it's just going to allow me to make some cuts so that we can flatten all that bone off, plane it all off, and that will give us plenty of, of restorative space at that point. Okay. The final thing is making sure everything is aligned. And again, this is kind of what we're doing. You saw, well, if you looked at that cross section, cross sectional view of all the different implants, there was seven, there was a couple straights on the back, and then all the front ones were between a 17 and 30 degree. Uh, multi-unit on there, the smart fix abutments in this case. And what you see is everything's still coming down like a picket fence. And this is what we are looking for is we want prosthetically everything to be a really nice picket fence coming down right where we want it to be. Okay. So that's how we go ahead and plan it from the abutment level, making sure we have adequate space and then making sure they're all aligned. Okay. All right. So let's get to treating. What we're going to do is we're going to look at three different cases just to kind of go through the rest of our time together. And each one of these has a couple little nuances to them. And so I will go through and kind of talk about the little nuances, which we see with each one of these things. And kind of from there, we can, you know, go through all, and again, all three of these are completely digital patients. And so we can go through all the little nuances and little different things, which we'll go on with all of them. Okay. All right. So let's first start with two different simple ones from two different ways of doing them. Okay. So the first one is this. So this is how this patient presented to me. It's just this, this canine up here, the number 11, and we're going to use what's called the Nazento pathway for this one. And what she'd been done, she'd actually been grafted, uh, hard and soft tissue grafted beforehand by, by another, another provider. So again, first things first, you know, take the CBCT, take the scan. And again, here's her intraoral scan. And then again, here is, we can see Again, verifying the bite, because again, my goal for these types of cases is anywhere in the anterior, I usually try to immediately load um, all of these types of cases just so we can, you know, get a nice provisional. Patients never really without teeth. But again, we're going to try to get a nice immediate load. So again, I need to know really precisely where things are coming together from an occlusal perspective. Okay. So I got the bite verified with my marks and the heat map, which we see there. And the reason why I kind of started off with this one is because this one actually has quite some, some nuances from a planning perspective. Because just at first blush, you just kind of look at that thing and you say, oh, it's no problem. We'll just slam it in. We'll be good to go. But when we look kind of closely at this one, why I chose, chose her is because she's kind of got some gingival issues going on in there. And what we see is this. When you look at her, what do you kind of notice about the site and about the gum levels? And I guess the better question instead of what do you see is what really should you see here? Because if we map these out, what we should be seeing and how these things line up when we look at the gingival levels to know exactly where these things need to go, the gingival levels are built from a relationship from your central incisor back to the canine, okay? And it's usually with a line. And basically what we see from this line is it's about five degrees higher than that central incisor. So it should go up just slightly. And when you, let's see, sorry, this got all funky there for a second. And what you, what you should be seeing is where the gingival zenith on these things with a, it follows a really simple pattern on your centrals. Your gingival zenith is about, it's about, nearly a millimeter distal to your central, your lateral, it's just a, mil it's a half millimeter distal. It's actually 0.4, but no one can tell the difference between 0.4 and 0.5. At least I can't with the probe, but it's just a half millimeter off and your canines right down the middle. So we've got for the level, it should be a little bit higher than the central here. It should be right down the barrel there with the gingival zenith right down the middle of the tooth. And that's what we go to plan. 
And so when we go to wax this case up and we really start looking at the case, and I turned off kind of the, I, I made this monochromatic so you could kind of see it a little bit easier. But when you look at her and you look at it from this perspective, you can start to see the deficiency which she has there. And again, this was even after grafting. So when we went ahead and waxed her up, in order to kind of get that tooth there with where the gum needed to be, it had to be this really, really big tooth here. And again, this isn't what we're looking for at all because what we want is we want this gingival level to be right there instead of way up higher. And so what I was planning on doing on this case was grafting at the exact same time of implant placement. And for this pathway, this was one I was gonna send everything to Dent Supply Serona to plan for me. So what I had to do is I had to tell them and said, yes, here's the wax up, but the bottom line is I'm gonna actually have my tooth here. So I'm gonna bulk up the tissue at the time of surgery so that they know, knew to build my provisional into this neck of the woods instead of way up to here, okay? So got all that information, sent it to them. They went ahead and planned my case for me. And again, this is what the Azento concept is, is you uploaded all the dent supply, they plan the case for you. And then what they do is they send you this box and it's got your surgical guide. It's got your drills. It's got the implant, it has a custom healing abutment in case you want to not load the case. It's got the custom abutment, the final custom abutment, which you have, and then it's also got a provisional PMMA crown. So you've got everything you need to be able to do the case. And so get the box, open up the box, and let's go through the case. So first things first is, again, you can see the objugates in there, so it's kind of pulling the tissue out of the way or pulling the lips out of the way. So we've got everything out of the way. And again, the guide goes on. The first thing with any guided surgery is you always got to make sure that these things are seated and seated well, because if they're not seated well, you go to drill and everything's gonna be off, okay? So I usually cut little windows right through here and through here, and I usually pick three spots on my guide so that when I seat it, I can make sure that it's seating down exactly how it should be seating down on the teeth. Now, these things are meant to be flapless, but remember when you looked at her, she was already deficient on the tissue. And so I'm not gonna go flapless on this because if I just punched it and went that route, I would lose all that, that tissue and she'd be even more deficient than when she walked in. So basically what I do on this part is just get a perio probe, probe the most lingual aspect of that, that wall right there so that I know kind of the most lingual part of where my drill is going to go. Then basically open her up, do a little papilla sparing incision here so I can take all this good tissue that's gonna be from this lingual portion and basically do a modified roll graft after to place it right here to really bulk up that area where she was deficient, okay? So go ahead and make a couple little incisions. You just have to make sure that your flap goes up big enough to clear, you know, and clear pretty easily. You don't wanna be strangulating the tissue while you're doing the surgery, but you know, just get it up far enough to clear. And then at that point, we're going to drill. And it, this is with the AstroTech EV guided system. What it has is the guides have this little sleeve built in, which you see down in here in the guide. And then what the drill does is the drill has a corresponding sleeve that goes into the sleeve in the guide and it's got a depth stopper and you just pump until you go all the way to the depth stop. So that's kind of how you go ahead and, and do the surgeries with these things. So go ahead and do that. Again, drill to depth, which you can see right there. And now again, this is kind of the genius of the system is the implant driver. And the way the driver works is is you've got all these notches on the driver and you have this one big driver or one big notch, excuse me. This big notch right here corresponds to this line that's in the guide, okay? Those two things line up together. And when you go ahead and spin that thing around and you line the two up like this, where it comes together like that, what that means is you've got the implant from an internal timing perspective, exactly like you had it on the software. Then the custom abutment's gonna fit, the crown's going to fit over the top. Everything's going to fit. If you go ahead and spin that big notch past, the abutment's going to be cocked. The provisional's going to be cocked. Nothing's going to fit right. So that's like the most essential part of this whole process is making sure you line that notch up with the line. Okay. So, and again, it all works through kind of the seventh internal notch within the AstroTech systems implant. So that's what you see here. As you see again, here's the big notch. Here it is flatted out. Here's the lower big notch. And it's just lined right up in that channel. 
And when we know it lines up in that channel, again, every piece coming downstream is actually going to fit right. Okay. So again, here, here it is. I just decided to put the custom healer on just to verify the fit. So again, the custom healer went on great, but again, my plan was to load this case. So I went ahead and put the, put the uh, custom abutment on, and then again, cemented it on. And the interesting thing with this case is what I wanted for this case, because she was deficient on the bone, you know, if we go back a slide, you can see my access was having to come through the front. And I really wanted this angled screw channel because I wanted to, or angled screw access, I guess I should say, because I really wanted to screw this in. But early on in this process, they said, well, we can't do it that way. So you're just going to have to do a, a standard custom abutment and cement. And I said, okay, but keep that in mind when we go to move forward. But what I did is cemented it on with that flap still open. That way I could make sure all the cement was off, not have any issues that way. And then went ahead and closed it up afterwards, making sure that all my cement was gone. But again, I was able to get this all closed. Here she is at closure. Here she is at one month. And again, we've got a nice, you know, gingival level going through here, kind of right where we would want it to be. We've got more bulk of tissue right through there. Here she is at the four month recall. It's all, it's all in there just fine. And now at this point, we're going to restore. Okay. So there's a couple ways to do it. If you know, you and the restorative doc like that crown that you have there, all you got to do is get that file and just mill it out of a different, a different material. Now, again, I really like, I really like cement retained or excuse me, screw retained restorations. So I said, Hey, look, can we do an angled screw channel on this finally? And they said, Oh yeah, no problem. We can do it now. I said, perfect. So I said, just go back to the original plan because everything fit well and make me a new one. And they said, okay. And so there's kind of two ways to do this to restore it is you can either make the crown. If you, you know, just remill out the crown out of something else, if you like it or make a new one or go ahead and do this, keep that custom abutment in, pull it off, go ahead and scan the abutment level. Then what they can do is use the old file that they built the first crown off of to come into there and make a new crown. And actually what we did on this one is I just said, go back to the original plan, make me the final and make me angled screw channel. So that's what they did is they sent me these two things, glued all together outside the mouth. And again, it just was unscrew the one, screw the new one in, went right in. And we, you know, it was pretty darn straightforward with it. Okay. But again, that's one way to do this. And I'll show you on the next case, kind of a little bit more simple way with the abutment level scan, which I showed you there. Okay. So that's one way of doing this. A different way is a similar process, but doing these kind of in your office. Like the Zento is great because it all just shows up in this box. But sometimes I like doing stuff. Well, actually <laughs> the vast majority of time, I like doing most of these things myself. So we're going to look at a little bit different case. And again, the one kind of we started with here. The patient presents like this. And there were a couple things with it that I was concerned about. So the first thing I told the patient, I said, look, have you ever noticed that, you know, your tooth's a little bit higher than the other tooth? He said, no, I've never noticed that before. And I said, well, notice it because last thing I want is when they're, when we get done with everything and we put that nice crown up there and he grabs the mirror and brings it this close. Cause that's what every patient does to have him go, well, why is that tooth a little bit taller? Well, the reason the tooth's taller is because the tooth was taller to begin with. And I say, we're going to do everything we can to go ahead and help bring this down. But if it doesn't go down, just know that it was a little bit higher and keep that in mind as we move forward. So he says, okay. Second thing, which was a real concern to me was the papilla formation. And this was a real concern because if you look at Tarnow's work, you look at Salama's work, Basically, papilla fill has to do with the crest of bone that comes down and where the contact area is. If that area is less than five millimeters, you're going to get a papilla in there about 98% of the time. On this particular patient, with a, being a triangular tooth like this, the contact area is going to be really low because of the shape of this tooth. And so because of that, I had about, it was about a 10% chance of getting a papilla to fill in there because this was about eight to nine millimeters. I said, hey, look, man, we're not going to be able to get, you know, your gum tissue to go down here. You're going to have a little black spot in between there unless, you know, we do a little bonding on this tooth. We do a little veneer on this tooth, you know, et cetera. And he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay with having that little thing there. I don't want to do too much with this tooth. So I said, okay, just keep that in mind moving forward. So he said, okay. So again, we go through the same process, 
scan the patient, plan the patient, you know, plan the tooth. And again, you can see where my contact is and you can see where we're going to have that issue with the uh, papilla going down there. So we do the abutment plan or the implant plan, excuse me, like you saw earlier, there's that three, two rule, which we talked about. And then what we do is again, similar to a Zento, but doing this all of ourselves is we will then send this plan over to Atlantis and Atlantis can create us the pre-op custom abutment. And what I did on this one was what's called the contour design. It's about a millimeter sub G with a chamfer margin. And then they'll send us back this particular file called the core file. And what you can do is this can go in literally any CAD system anywhere. You know, if you've got, if your lab's got lab software, if your dentist has, you know, Serac, Plan Mecca, they've got any type of software to design things, they can design the provisional right there from this file. Okay. And that's exactly what I did is I just designed it. I, I use a lot of lab software. So I just used lab software, design the crown. And again, the hard, the, the third hard thing about this guy was the shade. I mean, he had eight gajillion colors. The closest thing I could find was an A4 on him. But again, really pretty challenging from the, from the provisional standpoint. So I went ahead, designed that provisional, milled it out, put some texture on there. And then again, put some stains and characterizations to get it ready to go. So I've got my guide, my pre-op abutment and my pre-op provisional crown before we begin. Now this case is very similar to the other case um, except this one's an immediate. So, you know, be really careful taking the tooth out, irrigate it out, cure it really well out there and clean it out real nicely. And then the guide goes on, you know, just again, verifying that fit from this side, like we see there. Drill down, just like you saw in the last case. Go ahead and again, same deal. Here's your driver. There's that little line. Just spin that puppy down until it lines right up. And when that thing lines up, then you just put screw on the abutment, torque it on. <coughs> And then the final thing is going ahead and just sliding the provisional crown on, cementing it on. And again, if you want to do it screw retained, you can put it together outside the mouth and put it in. I prefer to do kind of what I call screw mentables where we, you know, I cement it in and then I'll, if I need to, then I'll take it off, clean off the cement and put it, put it back in. That way I know everything fits well in the mouth with these things. But this is the great thing is this is it first coming together in the mouth. You can see how well, the fit of this thing is. And again, it's all coming together right there for the first time in the mouth. And what we've seen is again, from a research perspective, the whole deviation of the whole process is, is when we did our pilot study on this thing was about 300 microns, which all, which is, you know, three tenths of a millimeter. So it's pretty cool. That way your plan and reality end up being basically the same thing. So patient leaves like that, comes back four months later. Again, tissue looks good. Provisional looks good. Everything looks good. At that point, I basically liked the shape of the crown and everything, but what I wanted to do was capture that little bit of tissue like we see here. So I popped off the provisional, scanned it, then I used the file that we had from this when we first made that temporary to make the final crown. So went ahead and scanned it like we see here. Built the final crown, milled it out, characterized it. Again, here it is in the mouth. The final, here he is. At, I think this was a three-year recall on it. And again, we've got some good stability, but did we get back the papilla? No, but we knew we wanted. So it's just one of those things that, again, that's why we go through this and tell the patient, you know, beforehand these things that we're going to do. Okay. All right. So let's end with kind of our final case here. We'll go to a little bit more complex full arch case. And with her, this patient presented here, she'd been grafted kind of multiple times through the front and again, had a kind of failing terminal dentition with the rest of her mouth and really just wanted to start moving, moving things forward that way. So went ahead again, scan the case, plan the teeth for the case. Again, we saw her earlier and what I was doing on her again, this was that cut guide, the bone reduction guide, which we see here. And she was going to be a bone born guide, which you see here. Now that gives me all kind of my surgical tools. And again, here is where we've got all those abutments coming through. One thing to really simplify our lives, you know, when we do these cases, when we've conventionally done these cases, you know, we have a denture ready. We kind of, you know, put some blue mousse on there, seat it up there, drill right through there and start doing our pickups that way. Well, what I like to do is I, I order this file type called an immediate smiles digital. And you order this when you order your guide. 
And the beautiful thing it does for you is, is it allows you to have all these positions of where the abutments are going to be. And it gives you a file with all those positions of where the abutments are. And the very cool thing about getting all these files is what you're able to do is you're able to put it back in the lab software or any software for that matter and design a pre-op provisional. And this is her wax up, but design a pre-op provisional so that with the holes in it, so that we can make the pickup and the provisionalization of these cases a whole lot quicker. So I went ahead and milled it out. So here it is milled out, ready to go. Again, this is where our proposals are going to be. And again, just a little side, if you're going to do this, you usually want to make these holes about five and a half millimeters wide because your, your temporary coping that you put on the multi-units is just a hair under four millimeters. So you need a little bit of wiggle room on there. So I generally say, you know, between five and a half and six millimeters, depending upon how kind of divergent things are. But now you've got it all ready to go. We don't have to cut all the flanges down. We don't have to go find where everything's coming through. Everything is pre-drilled, ready to go, so that it makes the provisionalization a lot quicker. So here she is, again, big, big flat, because this is going to be a bone born guide, plus we're going to need to reduce the amount of bone like we talked about in this, in this posterior and posterior on both sides. So again, big flat, take the teeth out. And then at this point, here's the bone reduction guide. The bone reduction guide goes and sits down. Again, it, it curls around the posterior sections here keys on the front to make sure that you've got that thing seated and locked in quite well. And then it's just taking, you know, your burr and going ahead and planing those down. So we go ahead and flatten the ridge out. And again, I think the hardest part on these bone reduction guides is right here at the edges. Like if you ever have any problems with the bone guide seating, it seems like it's usually these areas because we're using kind of, you know, a round burr or pineapple burr. And you know where that guide keys in in the back like this sometimes is 90 degrees. And when you're using kind of a rounded burr, you've got a little lip back there. So what I generally do is I go with a fissure burr and I place it like this and go zip, zip to kind of square off the bone there. And then the bone, the bone guides fit a whole heck of a lot better once I started doing that. But again, we've got it all leveled out. So now we've got the adequate space, which we talked about. The bone guide goes on so it seats, the bone born guide goes on so it seats really nicely down and in. And then again, it's just a similar process to what you've seen. So we just drill through there. The one difference though is we talked about with those custom abutments, you had to make sure that that big notch of the driver lined up with the line. With these stock abutments, they can fit in any of the six spots of the AstroTech implant. And so what you can do is you, you can use any of the notches to line up. It's just gotta be, it's just gotta be any notch lines up with that line. And then your, your multi-unit abutment or your smart fix abutment will seat down in there. So go ahead and do that. So now the abutments are in, then I used a little reamer in a couple of these areas to kind of plane the bone out. Again, here are the abutments on, which we see all here. Again, I didn't love the stability of this one. That's why I just threw a cover screw on it again just quickly picked up the provisional, closed her up. And again, we've got this nice provisional on her. And again, good result from the provisionalization, even though I never understand why people put lipstick on after things, but she's still kind of numb, but again, has a nice result from the provisional. She heals up without really any incident, came back, took off the provisional. And then at that point, we're going to move to impressions. And again, there's two different ways you can do the impressions as well. You can go the conventional, which we see on the left, where you can go the digital on the right. Again, there's no right or wrong way to do these. Both of them work and they both work well. I do a lot of digital impressions these days. And if you look at it, the way that the scanners are these days is they're just so doggone fast. I mean, just this tissue scan, the total tissue scan of doing this just took 33 seconds, which I think is super important, especially when you take a provisional off, that tissue can tend to flop. And the quicker we can go ahead and scan that area, we can get kind of, the true tissue contour of these things extremely fast. So again, that's kind of a real nice thing about using, using these, the latest generations of scanners. So again, there's our nice tissue scan. You can see all the anatomy really well of the, of the smart fix abutments and the rest of the tissue on there. Then you just put the scan bodies on and go ahead and scan it, you know, so you can register where everything is from that particular juncture. And then the really nice thing that you do get from doing these things digital is everything kind of cross arch mounts. You've got your 
your tissue scan, your scan body scan, which you see on the right, and also the provisional all cross arch mount. That way this can all go to the lab and the lab knows where everything is. And if you see, I've got the articulating, you know, marks down on the lower so that we can make sure everything is keyed in really well. So at that point, the lab designs a aesthetic trine. And again, usually we just do these out of, out of white. We don't do the white and pink, uh, but go ahead and try it in, you know, just got it smiles. And when we look at her smile, it was funny because, you know, she looked at it, she said, oh, I love it. It's great. And I'm looking at her and I think the teeth are a little bit too short. <laughs> so I say, do you love it? She says, oh yeah, this is the greatest. And I say, do you want them longer? And she says, well, you know, ah, I like these. And when they've got a response like that, I said, okay, perfect. And I wrote, you know, back on the lab slip, I said, okay, take the teeth. Let's bring them down about another millimeter to a millimeter and a half and go to final. So that's what we did on hers. Again, built her the final, and this is the final zirconia. So go ahead and do that, put it in. And again, we've got a real, real nice result for her. And when we look at her, you know, this is a great thing. We go from, from plan to temporary to final to pre-op smile to temporary to final. So we can get this really nice kind of predictable result all the way through as we go through these things. So I hope just in this kind of short amount of time, which we've had to spend together tonight, you know, you can kind of see this process of how it works of scanning, doing the two different types of scans, the CVCT and the intraoral scan, planning the cases, both from the prosthetic side and also using, you know, the three, two rule and the three A's for our larger cases, then how you can kind of put all these things together from a treating perspective. So thank you guys very much for hanging out and being with us today. If anyone's got any questions, you know, go ahead and put it in the chat. If, if you don't get a chance and want to send me a question later, you know, my email is mludlow2 at gmail. Feel free to, you know, shoot me an email. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for hanging out. Cause I know there's a, you know, you've got families, lives, everything like that. So I just appreciate you spending some time with, with me and going from there. So thank you all very much. Great. So Mark, thanks for that, uh, excellent talk. Um, and, uh, I found it very interesting personally, uh, a couple of questions that we have that have come in through the chat. The first one relates to, um, one of them is asking uh, about a, the proprietary name of a particular scanner. I'll get back to that. Um, sure. there's a question here regarding the X guide and I presume the, the participant is asking, uh, asking if you have an opinion on, they're referring to the X guide system for placing dental implants. I presume it's a, a dynamic navigation system. I was curious if you had any experience and thoughts uh, on that. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest. I think anything, I, I really like static guides personally, because I do a lot of immediate provisionalization. And so a lot of the workflows that we get from a static guide perspective, like, like you've seen here, you know, with the custom abutments, with the pre-made provisionals, all those different things, they're all, you know, built on kind of principles from, from again, the companies that make static guides, as far as the X nav, you know, or X guide or any of those systems, I think they're, you know, it, it's just like anything. One of my best friends and colleagues, you know, he's, he's a big Nobel guy uses the X nav all the time and just absolutely loves it and gets some great results. So I, I, I think, you know, we have one too that we use. Um, I, I think it's a great product. You know, it's just like anything. I mean, just learn how to use, what you have and, and, and go for it. But I do think it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice piece of technology. I wish those little, the clips that you use, I wish those would go down in price because they seem for about the same amount. I can, I can do a static guide. So, but the one thing I think that is great about it is, you know, with the static guide, it, unless you've got a printer in your office and can print something out real quick, if you have a patient that comes in, needs it immediately out then with, with implant placement, I honestly think that's one of the best things for the X nav or the X guide is because you can just take that right then quickly wax it up and then just go right to, to doing the surgery. So I think it's a great tool. So let me ask you in your, in your experience with a static guided surgery, um, what would be your number? If you had to give me your number one or number two scenarios where you, where you think you've, that represent limitations to static guided surgery. Are there any that you can think of that where you know, like if you're working with a resident and you look at the case coming down and you say, ah, you know what, I just want to give you a heads up here because I know 
I can almost tell ahead of time what you're going to do wrong here or what the compromise is going to be. Are there any, do you feel that there are any limitations in, in. Yeah. So I, I think I'd say one of the big limitations is, you know, especially residents early on in their career as when you go like a bone born guide, like that last one, which you saw of mine, the flap is huge. Mm -hmm. You know, these aren't little dainty flaps. Like you've got to flap everything out of the way. And I think a lot of, I think the bigger bone born and a lot of the bigger stackable cases, which I, you know, I don't know how many of you guys do stackable cases where, you know, you've got a base guide onto the bone and then you're putting other guides into that. Those require a monster, monster reflection. Um, and I think sometimes for our less seasoned residents, especially they're not used to flaps that big, even some of our chiefs, you know, they haven't for these types of cases, they're not used to having to reflect that much. And I think some, the, the limitation a lot on those, especially comes down on the lower arch where you're having to dissect out the mentals, reflect all the way down and keep everything out of the way on those ones. I tend not to do bone borne guides. I try to do, you know, if, if it's a terminal dentition, I'll keep a few teeth and do a tooth borne onto those teeth and then take the teeth out afterwards mm -hmm. so that I don't have to reflect, have this guide that's, you know, pressing on, on my flap down in the mentals and, and different things of, of that nature. But I, I'd say that's probably the biggest is bone borne guides and bone reduction guides. Uh, because and, sometimes if you don't reduce enough, you go to put the bone borne guide on and then, you know, it's, it's all over the place. And sometimes it's really hard to, to key it back in if you don't really know the fit and know kind of what you're looking for. I would say there seems to be a movement in popularity with the stackable guides. And in particular, I'm curious, I wanted to ask you about <clears throat> in, the, in the stackable guide sequence, one theoretical scenario or workflow is kind of the smile in the box thing that you mentioned, where basically the last step in your stackable guide sequence is the pickup of, of your abutments yep. and a prefab prefabricated set of teeth so that you're not actually doing a denture conversion. Yep. Oh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, it's, it's so I, I, I've helped you know, one company kind of developed their stackables and I've done probably at this point about 40, 40 patients worth of stackables, you know, some single arch, some double arches. And like the workflow that I kind of showed you on this last one with, with the immediate smiles digital, that's actually kind of my favorite thing is, and it's a similar concept. The one hard thing about stackables a lot is from the clean, it, it makes it quicker because you can key in the bite really well as long as you got that base guide in there well, but you've still got these little arms that are coming off right in the front of it that you've got to then cut off and get looking pretty again. And it just, that, that adds just a little bit more time. Whereas like, you know, on the way I, I do the one that I showed you and, and a lot of mine that way is everything's keyed in from the palate. And so I don't have anything coming off the facial at all where any of the aesthetics are going to be. And that, that's been one limitation that I've seen with stackables is, is these kind of the struts coming off that go into the base guides and then having to cut those off and then patch some pink back on there and different things like that. But again, that that's little, I mean, that, that takes you an extra 10 minutes, but again, I, we do a lot of stackables. Um, the one again, tough thing about the stackables is it's a lot of hardware going in there with a very, very, very big flap. Yeah. In oh. the uh, palatal key that you refer to, I noticed that in your in your delivery of your prosthesis, I guess, <clears throat> I mean, you know, I, I noticed also the, the retention suture you're using on the palatal to keep the tissues all bunched up, which is really nice. Does that paddle, okay. does variation in thickness of soft tissue interoperatively affect the seating of that palatal uh, reference? I was going to say, knock on wood, it hasn't, but that means it'll happen tomorrow because I got no, no, one no. or two full arches tomorrow. So yeah, it's probably going to happen. <laughs> but it, it does. You, you know, when I get to the provisionalization stage, obviously, you know, you clip those sutures, you lay it back down, you know, reapproximate the tissue. And then then what I do is I've, I've built them all kind of keyed in occlusively as well. So I'll seat it and then kind of close them into CR and make sure that everything's keying in that way because I like doing a closed mouth, you know, after I put in the material doing a closed mouth pickup so that they yeah. can close down in. 
So that way we, we get the occlusion keyed in. And again, that, that also is one nice thing from the stackable perspective is you don't have to do it closed mouth because theoretically everything should key in just fine with your stackable. Right. So I feel like we've run off on a tangent on stackable guides and I'm, we did. <laughs> and, and there's probably a whole, a whole, there might be a, a, some proportion of the audience that, uh, yeah, a lot of them know what we're talking about. Some of them may not have, may have no clue what we're talking about, but essentially the stackable guide. Well, I mean, you want to see one? I can pull one up real yeah, quick. Why don't we just pull one up just so we can give people an idea for okay. those who are, who are. Okay. Give me two secs. It's funny. That's here. Let me go back to sharing. So y'all could see. All right. It's funny. I had it, had one in version one. <laughs> so I could say this is version two. I told you I like switched, switched a bunch of stuff there at the end. Um, okay. It's so like, this is what a stackable is. And sorry, it takes a little bit for my PowerPoint to catch up with me scrolling through. Yeah, no problem. So I noticed you're using a metallic, uh, yep. metallic framework on that. Yep. Yeah. So again, what you do with a base guide gets seated with pins and you know, these are, these are push pins. And then we've also got fixation pins in there. Mm -hmm. And again, usually our big pins are going bicortical so that we can make sure we get some good stability. But, but basically what a stackable is, is it's got a base guide like this. And then, you know, all your other guides go seating into it. So, you know, like you drill through there, your abutments go through it. Again, this is, you know, making sure your smart fix abutments are going in the right spots. Are you making these in collaboration with a provider or? Do yeah, you this do is these? with, this is with a lab. So, okay. yeah. And I mean, there's a, it's funny cause you know, I first started it. And again, the way the temporaries come is, is like this. So it's got these little struts arms. Yeah. Those struts go ahead and key in into those areas there. And so you can kind of do the pickup with it there. But again, this is always the bummer. So these struts are right in the aesthetic zone. Hmm that you've got to then cut these out. And then, you know, a lot of times there's some surface glaze and different stuff on there and you've got to cut these all off and then make it, you know, make it look real, yeah. real nice in there. In a, um, rough estimate, in a rough estimate, would you say, how much time would you say this would save compared to a conventional denture conversion? So the funny thing is I actually think this way, you know, the way I kind of showed you here, oh, see, I didn't show, so I didn't actually show the conversion, but like, this way, I actually think it's the quickest for me because all I've got to do is cut this off right here, the posterior. And I, I think doing anything where you've got it all pre-drilled and you don't have to cut the flanges off, you don't have to do all those different things saves you. I mean, I think next week I've got two that we're going to have to do kind of the conventional way, you know, with, with these are ones that were were placed, but not loaded. And so the patients went into dentures. So I'm like, I'm not going to go ahead and, you know, like these are two resident cases and we're not going to, you know, print out or mill out sweet provisionals when we've, when they're wearing a denture, you know, we'll do this kind of the old school way at uncovery. And, uh, man, I tell you what, like the, usually the surgical side with all of them, when we do, when we do these types of cases go pretty quick. Yeah. And then when you have to do the conventional conversion, that's when things start to grind to the slow halt right. it's because you got to find where all the abutments are coming through and you got to grind through there. Then you got to keep seeding it until everything's passive. Then you got to go into the lab and cut the pallet out and cut all the flanges out and make the contours all how you want them. And that just takes for freaking ever. Whereas with these ones where they've got the pre, you know, we've got the pre-drilled holes in them, you know, or, or a stackable type as well. I mean, it saves, man, some of these, these conversions go so fast because everything's right there. You just seat it down on, you inject around it, it cures. You've got almost no cleanup and then you just close and, you know, and seat. So it's, it, it, it saves just a dramatic amount of time. Yeah. Let so me like I say, I'm dreading next week when we've got to do the two <laughs> conventional ones, yeah. but. Um, I'm guessing they're not going to be done in the same morning. Uh, no, it'd be a morning and an afternoon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, just let me jump back to some questions here. I'm, I'm hogging the sure. here. And sorry, uh, all we got off on this tangent. You yeah, know. No, 
but it, it, again, this the, the whole presentation, all this is for you guys. So whatever you guys want to learn about and talk about, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Oh, there's a question here. Uh, please ask Dr. Lolo if he has any tips on doing uni abutment impressions outside of using capital D E S S scan bodies. Uh, quote, uh, open bracket Astra doesn't have any proprietary scan bodies for uni abutments. Close bracket. So with all of that, just I would say just hold that thought for just a little bit. Okay. okay. You saw what was coming on the smart fix here. Okay. Just hang so, it. So to whoever asked that question, it's coming down. Yeah, it's uh, coming down the pike. To be honest, you pike, know, yeah. COVID really kind of. Oh man, I probably shouldn't even say all this stuff. But anyway, COVID really kind of messed up launch dates with things like severely. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I can say that without getting into trouble. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. just read in between the lines of what I'm saying is COVID really messed up kind of launch dates and something cool may be coming down real quick that may solve that problem that, you know, so you don't have to use the desk scan bodies and you actually have proprietary ones coming. Uh, and they may be gray and looking exactly like you saw in that last patient. Yeah. Would but you, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. We didn't hear it here. Would you mind um, uh, addressing a question that relates to a specific intraoral scanner? Oh no, no, no. So, no. Uh, does Doctor Ludlow have an opinion on the Medit M E D I T dental scan sold by Noble Biocare? Uh, yeah. That was part, yeah. So, so the way Medit is is again, you can buy Medit direct. You can get it through Nobel. You can get it through Shine. You can get it. You know, it's just distributed by a bunch of different people. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's funny, like out of all, all, whenever we talk about intraoral scans, like there's a lot of people with questions about the Medit, you know, and the Medit, I'll be honest. We, so we've got their new one as well. Their I7, what is it? I700. And again, it, it's a good scanner. It's, it scans quick. The tip is actually kind of a, quite a bit smaller than, than some of the other ones. So it takes you just a little bit longer to scan. But it's a pretty decent scanner. When we look at it from an accuracy perspective, you know, bar none, and again, this has absolutely nothing to do with dent supply, Serona, but like bar none, the prime scan in every study we've basically run since that has come out has come with the highest accuracy level. Okay. And the Medit, you know, again, we haven't tested the I700 yet because it literally just came out and we, we had it before and we're playing with it, but we hadn't kind of ran it through any of the the paces because we don't really want to do that until it actually you know is released but the meta you know the previous meta in, in the meta in the hd mode you know it gave pretty good run-of-the-mill you know accuracy so and, and the great thing about meta is just it's it's cheap there's no there's no um you don't have to pay any you know monthly fees or anything like that uh, the one thing you do have to look out for is it doesn't come with a laptop. So you've got to make sure like that's a hidden cost that like you just get your scanner and have to get the laptop sometimes with some vendors that sell it. Right. But, you know, from an accuracy perspective, it's, you know, it's kind of middle of the pack. It's pretty, pretty easy to use. The interface, I, I don't love as much as some of the other interfaces, but it's just like anything. You use it a few times, you're going to get used to it and yeah. it'll, be, it'll be fine. I mean, the one I pick up 90 you know, 90% of times, probably the prime scan, just because for, especially for that, those full arch scans, I, I want the absolute most accurate thing that way. So, and the prime scan gives me that, but that being said, I think the meta, you know, it's a good scanner. It, it does well. Yeah. So, Given your, your academic and scientific background, do you think there's a huge variation in between different types of scanners? I, I mean, this may be a very naive question, but yeah. you know, for example, the three shape, versus the Medit versus prime scan yeah so it, it can go anywhere from you know the prime scan we've got it clocked down to about eight to nine microns cross arch which is insane that's like what most lab scanners are doing is is it, that's in the realm of a lab scanner um you know some of the other ones like i say i i can't talk to the the i700 because like i say it just came out we haven't ran it through all of our tests kind of subjects and things yet but you know the previous meta it was clocking in at about actually let me just look it was funny someone was just asking me about this today well anyway there's no need to look but it was it was kind of in the you know the 30 40 50 micron range so again is there a cl big clinical difference for most of what we do between you know 10 microns and and 40 microns probably not 
But when we, but sometimes when we get to, especially the bigger full arch stuff, you know, and we're going directly to implant, especially, you know, it errors can be cumulative and, and it can add up. Yeah. Does it really add up to a clinical significance? I'll be frank. I, I just don't know. I wish I could say yes or no, but, but you know, every little thing helps. And that's why, that's like why I say, I generally pick up the prime for those. Um, but, but again, I, I do think it's a great scanner and I think it, it would do fantastic for, for the vast majority, if not everything that, that you may be looking at. Okay. There's another question here that I think is worth uh, addressing at, at a fundamental level. For cases where the pre-op dentition is heavily restored with uh, metallic restorations, such as amalgams or PFMs, do you ever have issues with scatter on the CBCT that results in difficulty merging the DICOM and STL files yeah. in the implant planning software? And, and how do you circumvent that issue? So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's something I think we all run into, right? Is, you know, especially when you got a roundhouse bridge or something, the whole thing just, just fluoresces. Um, you know, how you get about, there, there's a couple strategies. I mean, sometimes, you know, we've got one that we're doing, actually, we were just chatting about this today with one of the residents. One of his cases, lower roundhouse bridge, we're going to take everything out and, you know, place five implants down there and immediately load that. And again, it just fluoresced so bad and had so much scatter, like you couldn't see anything. So with him, we had to build kind of a little scan appliance that we could key into it. It's almost like doing a dual scan just on top of the, the conventional scan. But, you know, we just built a little scan appliance to go on top of that and scan that in as we're doing it. So that's one way to do it. Um, other ways, you know, when I have really complicated one, I, I do a lot of, you know, with Simplant. And if you own Simplant, what you can do is, is you can upload their, your stuff to Dental Planet yep. and their engineers will actually go ahead and merge it. And I, I don't think I have had one that their engineers haven't been able to merge yet. Cause I mean, that's what these guys do all day. And again, it costs you nothing as, as for owning, you know, with owning the software, right. but, uh, done again, that's the way I do most of these again with this one where we were chatting about today, we're doing a scan appliance on that one. I think we're getting him in next week or the following week to scan him. Um, other things, which I've done is go ahead and just put, you know, you can put glass beads on there, but those will fluoresce a little bit. We've tried different things like putting composite on mucosa and different things like that. And that'll fluoresce a little bit less, but we have still been able to merge it. But the reality is you're right. I mean, they're, they can be extremely challenging when you get, you know, all that PFM just scattering everywhere. And it can be pretty darn tough sometimes to do it. And, and a lot of times on those cases, those are the ones where we do move to a bone borne guide or something like that, because, you know, then we're being able to seed it down, you know, and go from there. So, cause we can threshold out the bone and we know exactly where the bone's going to be. So then we can just take everything out and seed it down on the bone. If you're, if you're treating uh, bimaxillary, say you're treating bimaxillary dentulous arches and you're looking to have, uh, for example, a porcelain fused to zirconium prosthesis in the maxilla, mm -hmm. um, number one, do you have any concern with uh, dual opposing zirconia bridges? Or zirconia. Would, you, would you rather have a ceramic on top and a hybrid on the bottom for wear properties or what, what's your preference in that regard? You know, there's, I, I think there can be actually arguments for all of them, you know, whether you, you do Zerk on top and like a, you know, PMMA, something on the bottom. I'll be honest. I generally do Zerk over Zerk. And the reason being is I just love the tissue response to zirconia because I just don't think it, it from what I've seen, you know, again, I started doing Zerks probably about nine years ago. And like, man, it's just night and day, the tissue response you get with zirconia versus conventional, you know, metal acrylics and even, you know, like PFM type, you know, porcelains over the top, you just don't get the same response tissue wise. So I, I'll be honest, I tend to do zirk over zirk just because of how much I like the tissue response from like a perio standpoint, is you there, know, yeah, go ahead. Is there such a thing as, uh, I mean, uh, I don't encounter this all the time, but I'm just curious as a prosthodontist who is very surgically oriented, do you, do patients often complain about noise when they have, I've had one and I almost brought that up. So I had one patient say, you know, it's the old, well, it sounds like it's clacking. 
yeah. you know, you hear that anecdotally from the podium all the time. And I've, I've had one patient ever complain about it. And, you know, on his recall six months later, he was fine with it. Um, but again, that, that can be, cause it's a very, if you, if you guys haven't done it, it's a very different kind of sound that you hear, mm -hmm. you know, with, with, especially with metal acrylic, you know, it's more thud kind of just sounding like, you know, like kind of teeth do, mm -hmm. but when you've got Zerk over Zerk, it's this more kind of ting, ting, like it's this different sound mm -hmm. and there's so little give between implants and zirconia that I think it resonates a little bit more. And that's, and again, I, I've, I've had one patient complain about that, but, but that's, that's been about it, to be honest, so, you know, have, have I had bio biomechanical problems, you know, no more than anything else, you know, a couple of screws loosening. There was one of our test cases when we first started doing this at UNC that, you know, it was Zerk over Zerk. The, the weak link is this, is the, uh, cement on the little tie base that goes into the Zerk. Um, that blew on a lower, actually he blew two of them and he just pounded down and split one of the implants. Mm. That was the biggest complication uh, we had. But again, that was kind of in the early years where we really didn't know too much of what we were doing. I, I hope you don't mind entertaining these questions. I have, I have a couple more because I, I oh, really it's fine. interested in hearing what you have to say. About yeah, we're that. good. I think my two girls are probably in bed by now. My son's probably watching baseball at this point. So, <laughs> uh, Sorry. Well, we'll try not to keep you too, too long. But oh, you're good, man. So if you're going zirconium, for example, in, in an upper jaw, yeah. uh, are you typically keeping them as a one piece? So my, my question relates to numbers of implants and it relates to seg segmentation of full arch prostheses versus keeping them as one horseshoe. Yeah. Can you meld that into one answer. Boy, we could talk the next two hours on that one. Yeah. Um, the short of the story is I probably do more full one piece stuff. And the reason being is because when you go segmental, you really need to have a perfect volume of bone to be able to place all the implants in the perfect spots to be yeah. able to go segmentals. So even I'll have a lot of patients say, you know, I want four, they'll, they'll want four, three unit bridges, for example. And I'll say, okay, well, the only way we can do that is if we, you know, if we do a hip and do X, Y, and Z on you to create enough volume so that we can put all the implants perfectly where we need them. Cause when you go, when you go horseshoe, you've got a little bit more flexibility as far as implant placement and position, et cetera. Whereas when you go segmentals, like you've got to be frigging absolutely on it. And, and again, I would love to do segmentals on, on all of my cases because that way, if something blows, only one thing blows, it's a, it's an easier repair, et cetera. But the reality is most of the time from the, the surgical perspective is what makes me not be able to go segmentals unless we want to go through a lot, a lot of grafting on, on okay. these cases. Cool. Does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. It, oh, it does make sense. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to, so there's a financial aspect to this as well. I mean, technically speaking, because if you're segmenting them, uh, theoretically your lab costs might exponentially increase because you're dealing with multiple bridges. So my, the way my lab works is the same price. It's a, it's a fixed price either way. Okay. So, I mean, because the reality is, guess how they make a segmental? They basically create a full arch and they section it. Yeah. You know, it's all milled out the same. I'll go, I'll go back to my lab guy. Not that I do these, but anyway. Yeah. You say, well, so, love those lab guys said this, you know, but. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, from, from the financial, it's the same, same from my perspective. So, uh, last question for you. And I think it, it's, I think this is, and I'm sure you'll probably agree the long-term maintenance and hygiene, home hygiene is pivotal to the success of this type of prosthesis. You bet. So I recently saw, uh, I think it was the American APA, the American Prosthodontist Association released a statement on long-term maintenance of, of, of the full arch prosthesis. Yeah. That was the AACP's position statement. Yeah. Okay. Which is the, what is the A? American College of Prosthodontics. Thank you. That's the one I was looking at. Yeah. Do you, what's your policy, uh, either in your practice on the removal of a prosthesis and, and uh, the, your philosophy in that regard? Yeah. So I, I, it's funny. I actually, I actually do pretty much what we say in the paper um, is I, I generally don't take them off. And again, that's one of the reasons why I like Zerk is because the tissue response is just fantastic on there. Um, 
I, I generally don't take them off unless there's a real solid need to take them off because every time you take it off, you know, again, with metal acrylics, those you're probably going to have to take off a little more because, you know, bacteria bind to that calculus binds to that all stuff bind to it. And, and again, the tissue is a little more PO'd and angry, if you will, with it. With Zerk, I, I tend not to take, like I say, with pretty much everything, I tend not to take it off unless I have a real reason to do it. Because every time you remove something, you're fatiguing those screws, those little itty bitty flipping screws that hold the prosthesis on. And, you know, talking to some of the engineers, you know, talking to the Nobel engineers back in the day, they said, you know, max, you can get maybe about four before they start to fatigue and you start to run into problems. Right. And so you got to, you got to build that into, to your maintenance program of, you know, like one of our residency programs, you know, our AGD programs, their director wants them to take it off every six months. And it drives me friggin' nuts because like they're, these things are pristine and they're taking these off and they're replacing the screws. Like, you know, these poor patients are paying like 800 bucks every yeah, like it's surprising. other visit <clears throat> for the screws, which is just insane to me. But yeah, I, I follow more, you know, what our position paper stated. Of, I, I, I try not to take, take them off unless there's a real reason to take it off. Okay, this is really my last question. Last yeah, question. I mean, you're good, man. If you guys got questions, you know, we're, we're good. I mean, this is, this I'm, is like a chat. I'm waiting for them to come in, but I think everybody's just anyways, putting up with me. So I'll just ask away. Do you think there's another material that's coming down the pipe that will replace zirconium? You I'm know, not... I don't know. I zircon I love zirconia right now because it's the best thing in my opinion that we kind of use. Mm -hmm. I hope there's something else better out there, to be honest. You know, because zirconia is kind of rigid. If you drop it, you know, it would be nice to have something a little, possibly a little, you know, it, we get into these darn academic debates myself and a bunch of my colleagues, like, you know, what's the ideal thing and what's the ideal X, Y, and Z. And unfortunately, everything w which we do has its goods and its bads. And you just got to figure out what, what really is, you know, what compromises you can live with. Okay. I, I was asking that question in the context of uh, the milled, I think there's some milled PMMAs that have really interesting, I heard surface properties in terms of very a tiny micro, uh, uh, a very smooth surface. That's pretty much yeah. more biologically kind than uh you know acrylic fused to, to metal yeah so like the pectin and peaks and different things like that and i think like mike block had had a speaker a couple years ago amos implant relative to that um you know and again i've used i've used those i have I'll be, I'll be frank i just haven't seen the same tissue response with those that i have with with zerk mm -hmm. um but again I, I think some of those things can work well Again, I, I've just had great success with zirconia. And, and again, the biggest thing really is the tissue response and the amount of bone reduction I don't have to do if I go with a monolithic zirk, whereas some of the, the PMMAs and the plastics, you still have to have a pretty sizable bone reduction because you can't thin it out enough to be able to go, you know, kind of an FP1 type thing. So that's so. that expression. I think it's pay with bone or... Hey, well, you know, and I, I don't know about you guys. I mean, man, my favorite thing back in the day was just, you know, laying this big flap and mowing down 20 feet of bone to get, you know, like 15 to 18 millimeters. And like, that was great. But then, you know, I, I sat there going, man, what's this going to look like when I have to redo this case in 20 years? You know, if I just sawed off half of the face and, and again, you have to do that if, if, if you're using, you know, certain materials. And that's one of the things that kind of drove me a little bit more to zirconia as well is I can be a little bit more conservative with, with my reduction and do, a, do a, a little bit more in the FP1 type realm, which, you know, and it, if you don't know what FP1 is, that's just teeth coming out of the gums instead of teeth and gums, which is a, a, a conventional hybrid, like an FP3. And, you know, with, with that being said, man, they're much harder cases, those FP1s, just because you've got to be so on it with all the tissue and our placements have to be really nice. But, you know, from the bone conserve, conservation perspective, I, I really do kind of like them for, for that. So I don't have to quite cut as much, you know, away on the day of surgery. So 
in my in in my world in terms of uh, you know where we are with patients and patients' ability to afford this treatment, it seems like um, the use of zirconium tends to add a certain a significant element of cost yeah. to to treatment acceptance. You know, unfortunately, but I do obviously I appreciate what you're saying in terms of the quality of the the biological response of tissues, but the the, the price point changes fairly significantly for patients to be able to afford zirconium prosthesis from what I, from what I understand in, out there in, in the world at large. I mean, from, from our perspective is, again, the, the way I do it, you know, from a lab perspective, you're looking maybe 1500 to about two grand more, hmm. which isn't all that significant in, in, in my perspective. So, I mean, I just tack on the 1500 or two grand more and go the, the better material personally. But again, everybody runs your practice differently. Everybody's kind of got, and I, and the way I actually do it, man, we should have had the lecture on full arch. It sounds like, but, uh, I, yeah. you know, I, I also do my package prices. You know, I just say it's, if I'm doing an upper, it's X amount. If I'm doing a lower, it's X amount. You know, I, I put in the amount of implants that I find, you know, useful and I use, whatever I find useful. And I, I kind of package things that way. And I say my metal acrylic is X, which I don't do hardly any conventional metal acrylic anymore. Cause from a maintenance perspective, you know, metal acrylic hybrids, you know, it, I think it's the 10 year mark. You have an 8% chance of being complication free. So, which is incredible because you get teeth popping off all the time, like in different things of that nature, when you go to a conventional metal acrylic, so I, I tend not to do a lot of metal acrylics because I have to fix so many metal acrylics. Interesting. So. Um, there is one question, so we'll close it up with this one. Uh, yeah. Any experience with zirconium implants that seem to be gaining in popularity? You know, have had it, it's funny because I had some experience back in probably two thousand. What was this? Did a you know just a just a couple experiences back in two thousand eight two thousand nine. And then had a long time period where I haven't had any. And, you know, we just had a resident patient come in um, with, you know, the, the surgery resident actually went and did, you know, got the patient allergy tested and they are allergic to titanium. So on this patient, we are doing zirconia. The, the interesting thing, which we're like, what the, the implant itself is zirconia you know, it's zirconia. And then the freaking abutment is zirconia, but it's got a titanium interface. We're like, what, what? <laughs> like this totally defeats the purpose. And so we're looking at using one of the other brands like that one. I think it was with Strauman. I think it was, and we're going to probably switch that Nobel Pearl for, for this patient. Um, just cause again, it has a true titanium allergy and they seem Again, the osseo integration seems pretty good. Again, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't looked super closely into it, but I think the bone to implant context a little bit less with zirconia versus with a standard titanium or commercially pure titanium or grade four titaniums. Um, but again, I mean, in, in those patients, you know, it, it, I, I'm fine with trying whatever, you know, if it's something that's going to benefit them and get them the teeth and things which they need, sure, why not try something? But again, I don't have a lot of experience just because I haven't had that many patients with a real need. And I'm not in a demographic where I get a patient coming in and saying, I don't want conventional titanium. I want, you know, this type of material. Right. But, but yeah, you know, I think it, it serves its purpose and, you know, should it replace standard titanium? I don't know. I'm probably the, the wrong person to ask for that question just because I really don't, don't do too many of them. No problem. That was from our executive director who tends to come up with these questions once in a while. And uh, I have to ask them because, you know, Oh yeah, no problem. He's our executive director, you know, he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, listen, Mark, I, I, I do want to let you get back to your family. It's eight 30. Uh, just to let you know, we had, a, uh, we peaked at about 97 participants. So cool. I'd like awesome. to thank everybody, all of our membership for logging in and for, uh, for your loyalty. I was just talking to Miller earlier about the fact that we're, uh, we just surpassed the one-year mark of these uh, webinars that started off with the big bad COVID and how we were going to cope with it and how it was affecting our practices. It'd be interesting at some point to do uh, an overview of uh, the year in review to look at the different topics we've had. This certainly was uh, an excellent one, Mark, one that was very, very uh, 
clinically uh, clinically relevant for us. So I really do appreciate uh, your time and energy in, in presenting this talk uh, to us. Uh, to us, uh, obviously, I'd like to thank our our, our sponsor, Dent Supply, for uh, for sponsoring and supporting uh, our association as as well as you guys do. Uh, just for information purposes, before we uh, before we log off, uh, our next webinar is on uh, June sixteenth, uh, and uh, we'll be on another subject. I believe it's on taxation and finances, uh, the dollar sign. And uh, I believe that we're going to enjoy the presence of one of our members, Kevin Long, that some of you may know, uh, who apparently has a lot to say on this subject. But uh, so that being said, thank you all for for being with us tonight. Uh, we traditionally just spend about five minutes online. Um, just if anybody wants to turn on their mics and chat for a bit, we can do that. Uh, we've ran a, a little bit long, uh, not, not, not in terms of your talk at all, Dr. Little, but in terms of our, our Q and A. So, um, uh, again, thanks everybody for, for, for logging on and hope to see you on, on June 16th. All right. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Have a good evening.